Let's, uh, let's pray together. God, uh, we were singing a lyric a little bit ago that said um, that it's your breath in our lungs. And uh, God, you know right now that my, uh, my body's not feeling well. My lungs are um, struggling. So I, God, I ask right now that you would be honored in this time, God, that you would fill me with your strength, that you'd allow my words to be your words as we talk today as as a, as a family here, God, that you would be glorified and that every single person in this room would be able to take a step of faith today, a next step in their journey. God, we give you this time and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I'm so uh, excited to be here with you guys. I wanted to highlight a lyric of that, that cool environment, environmental projection video we just watched. There's a line in that song that repeats, um, the line says, lead me to the end of myself, and then take me to the edge of something greater. Let me, let me tell you, if, if you were here a, a year and a month ago, we had a special ceremony on the stage where Pastor Brian Hamilton uh, handed the baton on to me as the lead pastor at this church. And uh, I had an opportunity to share some words at that event, and this song that you just saw on the walls um, was kind of my, uh, my, my anthem, if you will. Because those of you who know me well know that I constantly feel like God puts me at the edge of where I'm comfortable, the edge of my abilities. It kind of has me and asks me to stand out uh, on that, that line where everything beyond it is new, new ground, new territory. You know, each step I take is a step I have never taken before. And my prayer is that in this church, we would be a church of, of steppers, that we'd be a church of people who understand that wherever you are on your faith journey, listen, you might be pre-Christ, you might be exploring church, uh, exploring Jesus for the first time, and you walked in here and you're thinking, Matt, what, what step would you be asking me to take? I'm asking you to just explore faith in Christ today. That's you getting up to the edge of your level of comfort and seeing if God has something for you on the other side of that line. Now, for those of you who have given your life to Christ, that there's been a moment in your past where you said, you know what, I'm going to commit to following Christ with my life. You know, the, 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 the thing about following Christ, right, is that you have to follow Christ. That We talked about the sanctification, this process of becoming more and more like Christ. We have this idea of this, this line this, this, this frontier is everything beyond it, and we've never stepped beyond it. And the truth is that I want everyone in this room to, to step up to that line on a daily basis. God, lead me to the edge of myself and show me something greater and help me take steps into that frontier. And when I was uh, 13 years old, I had a chance to go on a trip with a friend and his family to a lake. And we were just spending the day at the lake, and we got to the lake. And you remember those boats? Uh, they still exist. I'm saying remember like they don't exist anymore. But you know those, those boats that you pedal? They're like a little, like a pedal or paddle boat. Uh, those things are hard work, aren't they? They look really easy. You see people out there like, oh, that looks fun. They're not fun, all right? So we... Uh, me and my 13-year-old friend, we're both 13, we, we, we rent one of those boats and we get on that boat and we start pedaling our little hearts out. We're, we're 13, we think we're on top of the world. We head out until our legs won't take us any further, which presents a problem. <laughs> so we are tired and we decide, you know, just for this moment, we're going to just hang out and let our legs rest. And we stopped and for about 40 minutes, we were just chatting and talking and enjoying our freedom. The problem is, is that this lake was one of those lakes that's made by uh, somebody installed a dam to kind of create this lake, and there, this is an active dam, so there's a current, and but 40 minutes later, we, we looked up and realized that we were twice as far away from where we started as when, let me just tell you, that was one of the worst days of my life. I thought my legs were going to fall. I, I, I remember getting out of the boat and I was like, uh. listen, here's the truth. We, we talked about this quote uh, last week from Pastor D.A. Carson. It says this. It says that people do not drift towards holiness. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. In other words, uh, you know, we're sitting out there in a boat 
And if we stop moving in our faith, instead of saying, God, take me to the edge of my faith, if we're taken to the edge of our faith and then we decide to, to rest, if we decide to not take a next step, what happens is we don't drift into the frontier. We don't drift into spiritual maturity. We don't drift into accidentally becoming more like Christ. We drift away from that maturity. We drift away from Christ and we call it tolerance. That's the truth. The, the problem with this truth is that it means that every time you, you come to church, if the truth is that in order to take a next step in your faith, in order to mature in your faith, there's, there's something you have to do. So the problem is, is I always have to be the messenger, right? You come to church and you're thinking, man, every time I go to church, the church is always asking me to do something. Matt's always asking me to, to take another step or to, to step it up or to, to serve or give. Or, there's always something the church is asking me to do. And, and at the end of the day, that gets really tiring to always feel like the church is asking something from you. Here's the truth I want us to, everything we're going to talk about today, I want to kind of encompass it with this one phrase. The church doesn't want something from you. They want something for you. Let me explain this again. Listen, when you come here on a Sunday, when you come here throughout the week, when you're in your life groups, when you're spending time in God's Word, and you see uh, something that it seems like there's, there's a step you have to take, that's not the church asking something from you. That's, that's me and, and the church from experience know, know, knowing that there is something greater for you, that there is something on the other line of that level of comfort that has been made for you to live in abundance. The problem is, it takes work. It's going to take some pedaling. If you just rest where you are in your faith right now, you are going to drift towards tolerance. You are not going to drift towards holiness. The Bible often talks about our faith kind of in the, in the structure, symbolically, of, of life cycles. Uh, an example of that, in John 3, it tells us that when you give your life to Christ, that you are, listen to this, born again. We have this picture of you. When you give your life to Christ, you are a brand new baby. Let me tell you this right now. If that's you, I love babies. Babies are like the coolest thing in the world, aren't they? And we celebrate babies, spiritual babies in this church, in this baptism tank right here. When someone says, I want to give my life to Christ, and they come and they're baptized in a new faith, and they are born again, they are an infant in their faith. And that's, that's okay. They've taken a next step in their faith. The problem is, is oftentimes we stay babies, we don't ever mature beyond this decision. I want to follow Christ and, yes, yeah, sure, I'm going to start taking my family to church. I think it's good for my kids. But we don't ever take a next step. But the truth is that you, you, you fast forward to Hebrews chapter 12 and, and you see this, this idea that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we ought to throw off anything that's hindering us so that we can, listen to this, run the race. I have never seen a baby running. You see, this is a, a sign of spiritual maturity that when you are born again, you're this new baby in Christ. And as a new baby in Christ, you need to step up to the frontier. Man, you got to learn how, how to crawl. For you, that next step is going to be a crawling step. And that's okay. That means you're, you're progressing. You're not drifting away from holiness. For those of you who are crawling, you need to learn how to, to stand up and, and take a step. You need to learn how to walk in your faith. For those of you who are walking, the Bible says this, this faith journey wasn't made for walking. It was, it was ultimately made to be ran with endurance. We've got to learn how to step up our faith yet again and to run the race that God has set out for us. So my challenge is that everyone in this building would constantly be making steps, that you would be walking up to the line, that, that level of comfort in your faith, that you would be constantly uh, committed to maturing, to taking that next step to see beyond into the frontier a place you've never been before and recognize that there's something greater over there for you. And one of the ways we encourage people to, to take those next steps, in fact, if you were to ask me, hey Matt, what, what do you think about my faith? Do you think uh, my faith is mature? Do you think I'm 
Uh, I'm pre-Christ? Do you think I'm, I, I'm a newborn? Do you think I'm crawling? Do you think I'm walking or do you think I'm running? If you were to ask me what I thought about your faith, usually the things that we use to kind of understand a person's spiritual maturity are what we call our five catalysts. I'm going to put them up on the screen. These five catalysts right here help to, to recognize whether or not you are embracing next steps in your faith. The first one, to worship regularly. If you say, hey Matt, do you, do you consider me to be a follower of Christ? I'm going to ask you, are you worshiping God regularly in corporate worship in a church? Or is, it, is it a priority for you to be in church or does the weather determine whether or not you get out of bed and come here? What about connect relationally? Are you, are you taking steps in your faith to realize that when you just gather in rows in a church of 1,750 people, that it is very hard to connect with followers of Christ? You need, to, you need to make a commitment to find circles in your faith. You need to find a life group, people who pour into you intimately, that show up at your bedside when you're in the hospital, that are making you meals, that are praying for you and your family. Are you connecting relationally? Or how about this? Are you growing are you spending time in God's Word on a daily basis? Are you spending time with God in prayer? If you tell me, Matt, I'm not doing that, then I will say, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe you're still crawling. And, and if you want to learn how to walk, you're going to have to pick up God's Word and you're going to have to learn who God is so that you can be like Him. Remember Colossians 3, we learn who God is so that we can emulate Him. In my family, we, we spend breakfast together in God's Word. And one of my rituals is when I drive to work, uh, before I get out of my car and I go into the office, that's my quiet time. I sit in my car and I, I spend some time with God in prayer and in his word. And, and that moment, for whatever reason, my car is on my little safe space. No one bugs me when I'm in my car. Are you spending time growing? What about serving sacrificially? Are you plugged into the life of the church through your gifts and talents and the one that we're going to talk about today, listen, we're going to just do this together to get it out of the way. When I tell you what we're going to talk about today, I know what you're already thinking, uh, so we're just going to all say it together. We're all going to go like this, oh, because that's what everyone thinks, right? When the church, when the pastor, preacher wants to talk about giving, uh, we're all going to give a little sigh. Are you ready? And the one we're going to talk about today is giving generously. Oh, yeah, I know, right? What? Here's, here's a funny thing about giving. First of all, if you're a visitor in this room right now, we don't talk about giving very regularly. We, we maybe talk about giving four times, uh, you know, dedicate a sermon to generosity, maybe about four times a year. So uh, just bear with me today, visitor. I'm so sorry. Um, some of you are thinking, you know, I invited my neighbor today, Matt. Well, why can't you just like pour into us? Why can't you tell me, uh, you know, that everything's going to be all right? I, Matt, why do we got to talk about giving? Maybe you're hoping that I pray here shortly so you can find your keys and sneak out. It's not going to happen. You're here now, all right? No more prayers until the end. You've got you to sit through this. Um, the truth is about generosity is that if you were to ask me ultimately, Matt, what, is, what would you say is the one thing that you think really shares whether or not a person is mature in their faith? I would say it's this last one. It's whether or not a person is, is financially invested in the cause of the gospel. In fact, listen to this. The way we use God's resources reflects the maturity of our faith and the urgency we see in the gospel. I really want you to, to soak on this for a second here. here. Here's a thought. If you truly believe that there are 4.5 billion people alive right now that don't know Jesus, and are going to spend uh, forever, an eternity apart from him in a real place called hell. If you really believe that, I bet I would be able to tell by seeing how generous you are in investing in fixing that problem. How urgent do you see this great commission? How mature are you in your faith? I think that generosity is the thing that will help us to figure that out. So our big idea today is this idea that generosity, in, in most cases, it's a pretty crazy thing. It doesn't make sense to most of us. In fact, if you look at this picture right here, I'm going to have to say this slowly. If you look at this picture of a pitcher, you see that it is overflowing. 
we're, we're talking about this idea of overflow. One thing that doesn't make sense is you're saying, hey, Matt, you're asking me to take my, my pitcher of water and to pour it out, to be generous, and yet somehow you're talking about overflow. Don't you want uh, to leave your pitcher alone if you want to see it overflow? If you're pouring it out, that, that doesn't seem like that's counterintuitive to overflow. Listen, I'm with you. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But in the context of biblical generosity, somehow we're going to explore today that when you are generous, when you pour out, God causes you to fill to overflow. I don't know how it works. I don't know why he's so generous back with us. But I want to explore that together. And the truth is that it doesn't really matter in this room if you are rich or you are not so rich. It doesn't matter if you are loaded or you are unloaded. Every single one of us in here has the ability and the call to be a generous person. If you would do me a favor, let's uh, turn to Matthew chapter 21 in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, I want to make sure you leave today owning a Bible. So what you can do is grab the Bible in the chair back in front of you, take the pen, write your name in it, take this Bible home with you. Uh, We want you to to be able to learn about God in His Word. Matthew chapter 21, it's on page 591 if you're using... um, By the way, I I think you guys have figured out by now I'm not feeling great. Um, So if I like have to cough or blow my nose, I told the sound guy just to mute me so you don't have to hear it. Um, But what I wanted to share today is so important to me. I I wanted to make sure to be here. Uh, So I won't be at the big green wall after service to greet you. I'm going to hang out backstage for your sake. Um, But anyway, uh, we'll get through this together. Matthew chapter 21, first 11 verses. It says, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. He said, go into the village over there. He said, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Those of you who, who know what Palm Sunday is this, is, this is Palm Sunday, right? They're laying their palm branches out on the road as Jesus is triumphantly on a donkey riding into town. Since Jesus was in the center of the procession and the, people, uh, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. The entire city of Jerusalem. I underline that word entire city so you can see what, what the result of this was. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet. The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is hardly a a passage that a pastor would turn to in a sermon about generosity. So bear with me for a minute. I think out of this passage, there are four crazy things I want you to learn about generosity. And the first one is this. Four crazy truths about generosity. The first one is this. The God of all creation asks us for what he needs. Did you pick that up in this passage? We saw in in chapter 21, verse 3, it says, If anybody asks why Jesus or why these two guys are taking the donkey and the colt, you just tell them that Jesus needs them. Is that not crazy to anybody else? Think about this for a moment. This is the God who created everything in the universe. 
This is the God who took a boy's snack and somehow turned it into a meal for thousands of people. This is the God who, when there was no wine left, he took some water and he turned it into wine. In this moment, Jesus could have been standing there saying, I need a donkey. And he could have done whatever he wanted to create a donkey. He could have said, hey, bring me that cat. And that would have done us all a huge favor, right? <laughs> Sorry, I have to daily, daily offend cat lovers. Um, in that moment, listen, he could have done whatever he wanted to do to create a donkey. This is the God who created man out of dust, right? He could have in that moment said, uh, listen, prophecy says that I need a donkey to ride in Jerusalem and I need a donkey. Boom, donkey. Boom, colt. In a moment, he could have created it out of nothing, but for some reason that is completely absurd to me, he doesn't just create a donkey out of thin air. He says, listen to this, you go tell that man I need him to be generous for me. Why in the world would the God of all creation need you and me to provide anything for him? I don't know. Can you imagine if a friend of yours who has more than you, uh, uh, just a, a filthy, filthy rich, just someone who's got a ton of money comes up to you and says, hey, can I borrow 2,000 bucks? You would think, wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you be asking to borrow money from me? I should be, I should be borrowing money from you. And yet for some reason, it doesn't make sense to us, the God who owns everything needed what this man had to offer. That's crazy. Here's another, another crazy truth about generosity. Number two, Jesus rides on the generosity of ordinary people to change lives. I'm going to say that again because there should have been some amens there. Listen, Jesus rides on the generosity of ordinary people to change lives. Again, God could have arrived any way he wanted to. Jets didn't exist yet, but he could have arrived on a jet if he felt like it. He could have arrived on the cloud. He could have arrived in a chariot of fire. He could have come on this really cool white horse, but instead he comes into the town riding low on a donkey. Uh, Louis Giglio says he, he came into town riding low on a donkey, so maybe you should get off of your high horse. See, the truth is that Jesus rides on the generosity of people like you and me to ride into town where it says the entire city was praising God and recognizing that he was something awesome. The truth is the same here. Listen to this. I don't want you to miss this. I put it on the screen for you. Jesus comes into Glen Burnie on the back of your generosity. If we want to change our city, if we want to change our region, if we want to change our state and our world for Christ, Jesus rides into the lives of people through our generosity. It's crazy to me because he could have arrived any way he wanted. Another observation about this point. Notice that nobody praised the donkeys. They praised the Jesus riding on the generosity of you and me. You see, when we're generous, people aren't going to say, oh my goodness, look at, look at the generosity of the people. No, they're gonna, your generosity is going to point people to Christ and they're going to see a Savior that they've been hoping for and longing for. People aren't going to praise the donkey. They're going to they're praise the Jesus that's been introduced into their life through your generosity. Here's another crazy truth about generosity. This one's wild to me. It says that generosity writes us into the story of God. Is that not amazing to you that God allows us somehow to give to him what is already his and in exchange we find dude with donkeys in the Bible. 
See, no one in this room is incapable of generosity. Every single person in this room, we are all so full of wealth, even just in our, in our experiences and in our abilities and in, in who God has made us to be. Inside each of us is an abundance of wealth, and we have the ability to be generous with it or to hoard it for ourselves. The Bible says, though, that when we're generous, when we, when we allow God to pour out from us, when we take our pitcher and we pour out into the lives of others, that it writes us into the story of God. And the, the funny thing is, is God does not need you to be a part of a story. In fact, the converse is true, that when we're greedy, we're written out of the story. He's going to accomplish, he's going to get to the end of the story with or without you. You do not need to be in his story. This is the alpha and the omega. In fact, the word history, right? You can break it into his story. It is his story. You do not need to be a character in it. He's going to fulfill his purpose with or without me and with or without you. But the truth is that when you're generous, when you give, when you are poor out, you can be written into what God is doing. There, there's a church in, in Glendora, California, I've never been to the church. I have never met the people I'm about to talk about in this church. But the people at that church were generous and they gave towards the mission and vision of this church and they they poured into their community and because of their generosity, a high school girl, my mom, gave her life to Christ. I will never meet the people who, who donated money, who, who were generous in the life of that church so that they would be able to, to be a part in changing my mom's life. And my mom, when she met my dad and they started dating, my, my mom led my dad to Christ. And then when they, they had me and my, my siblings and we were being raised in a home, we, we were introduced to Christ early because my parents understood uh, the, the value in, in having a life that was centered on the, the goodness and abundance of Christ. See, the truth is that I will never, uh, on this side of heaven, meet any of those people who donated uh, or were generous in the life of that church. Yet, their, their, their generosity can be seen in my life. It can be seen in the life of my daughters. Uh, about, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I, I did an exercise. I, there were two men in my life that had a huge impact in, in helping to shape me when I was in my, my high school years. And I did a little bit of research and I found the men in their lives that mentored them guys I had never met before. And I wrote them a letter. I said, listen, you don't know who I am. We're probably never going to meet this side of heaven. But you made an impact in the man's life who made an impact in mine. I want to thank you. You see, in that instance, those, those people, the, those people who are generous with their time and their talent and their treasure, they, they were able to be a part of God's story You know, an unfortunate truth this morning is that at ACC right now, uh, we're about $70,000 behind budget for the year. And that sounds like a really big number. Uh, don't get me wrong, that is a really big number. <laughs> uh, in the whole scheme of our budget, it's, uh, it's not like we're, we're laying anybody off, but here, here's what this means. It's $70,000, uh, it's about 10% behind budget where we're supposed to be right now, what it means is that when somebody on our staff or someone in our leadership has an idea of a way that we want to continue to to share the gospel to fulfill our mission and our vision, what happens is right now, uh, the the answer most of the time is we, we can't right now be a part of that story. But through the generosity of this church, if, if this were a generous church with extraordinarily generous church, we could, we could easily be way, way over budget. God looks at $70,000. He's like, what? What are you worried about, Matt? That's nothing. But he calls you and me to be a part of it. He allows us to be written into his story. Uh, Louis Giglio uh, describes a, a part of heaven like this. He says, that heaven is the unfolding 
of our generosity in the story of God to the glory of Christ in the lives of people we have met and we haven't met. In other words, one day when we get to heaven, I am going to be able to find the people whose generosity made my mom's faith possible. And I get to thank them. I believe with all my heart that if those people hadn't been generous, my mom still would have met Jesus. He would have written this story. If those men hadn't had an impact in my life, he would have uh, had other people come uh, behind them and, and fulfill his story. His story is going to get written with or without you, but the truth is that you have the ability to be written into the story through your generosity. Here's a fourth one, and probably the craziest one of all of them. This one doesn't make sense. This is completely nuts. It doesn't sound, it doesn't sound spiritual. It doesn't sound spirit-led. You're going to hear this, and you're going to think, Matt, what are you talking about? Is that really in the Bible? In fact, it's so crazy, I have to spend time uh, uh, explaining what I mean before anybody leaves here with, a, with some terrible idea in their head. Listen to this truth. Whatever you pour out to God in generosity, you get back in overflow. That's crazy. That doesn't even make logical sense, Matt. How, how do you pour out something and then find yourself overflowing? That just, those things don't go together. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, to hear the story that we give God something that's His already, He thanks us for it and says, because of your generosity of giving back to me what was already mine, I'm going to write you into my story and then even get this, and then I'm going to give it back to you what was mine to start with. How does, that just, that's got to like just be completely crazy to you. The, the truth is I'm not talking here about the prosperity gospel. There are certain churches uh, that, that teach a certain theology that we don't uh, subscribe to here at Arundel Christian Church. I'm not telling you that when you give and are generous, that if you leave here and go home and you open up your mailbox, it's all going to be there plus extra. That's not what I'm telling you. Now, here's what I will say. Is God capable of doing that? Absolutely he is capable of doing that. I have had my mortgage paid, uh, literally a computer glitch is what they called it. It's a God who paid my mortgage for me. Can God bless you financially here and now for your generosity on earth? Absolutely he can. But we are not teaching at this church that when you give generously here and now that you will be blessed here and now in overflow. The Bible tells us exactly what he means by this. In Matthew 6, 20, it says, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. The Bible says that when you pour out anything that you are generous with here on earth, God is going to take that. He is going to set it aside for you in heaven and you are going to be able to enjoy it with interest in eternity forever. When you are generous here, you're storing up for yourself there forever. That is mind-blowing to me. And the question really is, do you believe any of this? And again, you're not going to like this, many of you. But if I want to know whether or not you really believe it, your checkbook is going to prove it. I'm not going to ask to see anybody's checkbook. See, the truth of the matter is the guy got his donkeys back. If you, if you understand and trust the truth of the gospel, if I, again, if I want you to invest in, in a business, if I have an idea, something I think is really important, I ask you to invest in it, the way I know whether or not you really believe in my idea, the whether or not I know you really believe in the direction and the mission of my, my new venture is whether or not you invest financially. If you just say, Matt, I'm going to cheer you on. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be there on your opening day, your ribbon cutting ceremony. I'll even help you paint your new office. I'm going to say, so you don't, really, you don't really want to be a part of this. You see, the way we, we spend the resources that God has placed in us in stewardship over shows what we really believe about the gospel. See, here's my so what for you. I want to ask you to grab this little card. I 
See, I believe uh, on this card that you'll see on this, if you look at this side that has some different gray boxes, different shades of gray, that there are a couple, a couple things I want to ask you to consider in here. As you're, as you're walking up to the frontier, if you're, as you're walking up to the edge of yourself and you're saying, Matt, this is as much faith as I've been able to give in the past as far as my generosity is concerned. You know, last week and the week before and the year before, this is, this is the edge, Matt. I'm standing right now where I have been. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to have the, the courage to step up now to the edge of myself and to see that beyond here as I take a next step, you're leading me to something greater. Let me, let me give you a, a couple instructions. One, if you are a visitor here this morning, just rip this up. I throw it in the trash. This isn't for you. I want you just to be a guest here with us this morning. If you're a new believer, a, 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 a pre-believer, if you're exploring faith in Christ and you haven't decided yet whether or not you see any value in, in, in investing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then I want you just to check that first box. And that means I don't want anything from you except for you to be faithful in coming here and exploring who Jesus is and what he did for you. But those of you, listen, who have made a profession of faith, you have decided to follow Christ, I want to ask you to step up to the edge of where you have been and take a next step in spiritual maturity through your giving. And some of you, you need to learn, some of you, you're newborns, you're brand new to faith. You need to learn how to crawl this morning. And, and the crawling step for you would be, you know what, man, I'm not ready to, to fully trust God with a full tithe, which means tenth of my income, but I, I'm willing to take a first step. And I'm going to commit to giving 5% of my income towards the cause of the gospel. I want to ask God to teach me as I progress in my faith. Some of you, you need to, to learn how to walk today. Maybe you've been given here and there. Maybe you, you drop whatever's in your wallet in the offering plate and that's been kind of good for you or you have some sort of cap. Uh, uh, here's how much I feel comfortable giving. But for those of you, maybe you need to take a next step in your faith and you need to learn how to give a full tithe the way the Bible teaches to give 10% of your income. Here's the, the crazy thing about a tithe is the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 that that. When, when you do that, when you give a full tithe and you bring your tithe into the storehouse of God, that he will bless it to overflowing. In fact, we, we believe in that challenge and, and Jesus, the God, God tells you in Malachi 3, test me. If you don't believe that I'm capable of doing that, test me in it. And what we want to do, we have on this backside this thing called a full tithe challenge. What you can do this morning is, is start being a full tither giving 10% of your income. And if in 90 days from now, you are not convinced that God was able to do more with 90% of your money than you were able to do with 100, call me. And without a single question, I will refund that back to you. I will give it back to you. Because I know that God does what he says he's gonna do. I know that God can do more with 90% of your money than you can do with 100% of your money. Another option on here is those of you who are ready to run. You've been given 10% of your income and you're ready to, to, to run and to maybe step up your, your giving or, or maybe pick up somebody who's an infant in their faith and recognize the first season. I need to carry uh, all these new believers in our congregation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to up my giving to carry some others who aren't ready to give for themselves. And one of these boxes down here that's most important is so just a recognition that when you're not here this summer, when you're on a vacation or you're away, ministry at ACC doesn't stop. The Great Commission doesn't take a vacation. So I want to ask you to, to commit, even when you're not here, to continue to give regularly to the church. And don't make it a habit of only giving when you're here on a Sunday morning. Because we, we rely on your generosity to fulfill the Great Commission and the mission and vision of this church. So as we, uh, I'm going to pray and as we worship together, I want to give you an opportunity to ponder this and to, to think of how you might respond to this truth this morning. Let's pray. Father, I, I know full well that you are a God who doesn't need anything from us. Yet for some reason that doesn't make any sense to us, you decide to rely on us to fulfill your purposes on this earth. 
that you allow us to, to give of ourselves. And Father, right now I ask that every single person in this room would be taken right now to the edge of themselves. God, this is the edge of what I can give. This is what I have been giving. This is the most I can give. God, take us to the edge of that and then show us that there is something greater as we mature in our faith and, our, and become more generous today to you. We love you and we thank you for challenging us this morning together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's worship together as you consider this.